I'd like to talk to you about the three most significant or unique aspects of the West Australian dairy industry that really set it apart and make it somewhat challenging in terms of evaluating, especially here on the South Coast. The West Australian dairy industry is like a pimple on a pumpkin, and that's why I have a pumpkin on the first page of a dairy story. We are tiny on not only a national stage, but certainly a global stage. We're also the most isolated dairy industry in the world. So Perth is the most isolated capital city. We are the most isolated industry. Now that brings with it a certain advantage in that there's another board that helps no end with our biosecurity. We are a safe, disease-free industry and that's wonderful for us. But it brings with it some interesting challenges that I'll go into. And the third is that we are proudly a grass-fed industry. The West Australian dairy industry doesn't have a barn full of cows like you see in some other states and certainly throughout California. We can really um, ride on the coattails of that really important clean green image. It's very genuine. But grass, as the farmers in this, in, in this audience would know, isn't always grass. So if I put up those two examples of grass, the one on the left is some autumn grass. The one on the right is some spring grass. Now, as you're driving past in your car, you say the, gra the, the paddock is green. It's good, we have grass. But actually, the image on the left, on this particular paddock, is one quarter as nutritious as the image on the right. Now, a cow is just like a person. She is, she is what she eats. And so does it therefore make sense that the cow's production in spring is a whole lot more, naturally, if she's just eating grass, than it would be in autumn? But here's the kicker. We have drinking habits that don't actually change, whether it's September or March. And so, as a consumer base, we actually like to drink or consume the same amount of dairy products on a daily basis. So that obviously brings with it some interesting little challenge about our grass-fed industry. Then, let's chuck in a nullable. 96% of our dairying cousins live on the East Coast in a very intensely populated dairying region. And town by town, there is a processing factory. In Western Australia, we have three processing factories. And when it gets to spring, what happens over east is if there's a bit too much milk for one factory, they chuck it in a truck and send it just up the road and turn it into cheese or some beautiful extended shelf life product. In WA, the road we have to chuck it on is the Nunnabore. That is very expensive. And so I can hear you say, well, surely, surely we can do something about it. The clever people here must surely be able to create a greater value add to deal with our spring surplus. But then, Let's come back to that pimple on a pumpkin and just remember how small and actually insignificant we are. So we are 4% of the national milk production in Western Australia. Then um, let's take it down to the precious Great Southern and there's 13 businesses down here that supply together 10% of West Australia's milk. So 10% of the 4%, if you like. Those 13 businesses produce on an annual basis about 35 million litres a year. They employ around about 60 people together, and that includes the, the actual business owners. And together, they supply three different factories. And so the milk goes on a tanker from Albany or Denmark, and it whizzes up the highway to either Harvey Fresh in Harvey, or a Browns, or the Pura plant um, owned, owned by Lion. So, People often say to me, Esther, that's just a little bit crazy, is it not? Then let me put the context once more. So we've just heard Sharon's beautiful presentation about the Dellendale cheese story. So the Dellendale cheese, as Sharon mentioned, um, they buy 10% of Mal Hicks' uh, milk, annual milk production. However, Mal is one of the smaller dairy producers out of the 13 down here. They actually buy 0.3% of the milk in the Great Southern to go into their beautiful Dellendale cheese. I rang Chris before this presentation. I said, Chris, what would it take for you to go from 0.3% of the milk that's currently produced in the south, in the, on the south coast to, let's say, 3%? You know, how would it be if you had 10 employees and an export licence and a few cool things like that? And he got all excited and went, yeah, Esther, I'd be able to actually perhaps have a weekend off. That's cool. And, and, and then he kept on thinking through and started talking about actually how hard that might be and that he would need some external investment and have to be responsible to somebody else as well. And he said, to me, you know what, Esther? I think I actually, I think I actually am in my comfort zone. Interestingly, 
When I speak to highly profitable, successful dairy farmers, and I say to them, you know, if the market signals were right, would you, would you go from 5 million litres a year to 10 or to 20? And you know what the usual comment back to me is? Going, Esther, I, I think we make enough. I think we're busy, we love what we do, we're happy. We're in the comfort zone too. How about I just take you out of the comfort zone for just a moment? In preparing for uh, this presentation, I had to really think about value adding because I, I actually, my role is very much grassroots. So I, I get to hang out with dairy farmers all the time and I don't do too much beyond that when it comes to dairying. So the purpose of value add, firstly, it's to create or respond to a market, I would imagine. It's certainly to drive the economy of the local business, local region. We want value adding in the Great Southern. Desperately, it will be good for us. And we certainly want to make sure all the people in that value adding process are making profits. So the dairy farmer, the cheese maker, the retailer, everybody needs to be making profit. And of course, therefore, we need the product to be more expensive than the raw version of it, or the pre-value added version of it. And so as part of getting ready for today, I actually had a fascinating conversation with the CEO of Food Bank. And I learned that in Albany last month, 29,000 meals were handed out in Albany. That's nearly 1,000 people a day calling on the generosity of people in this region donating meals to Food, to food Bank. I was absolutely blown away. And then I had a conversation about what was in those meals, and you know what? Not one bit of dairy. Because dairy was perceived as expensive. Cheese, yogurts. And I said, what about milk? Does somebody give them milk? And they said, no, we don't have any dairy in the meals that we actually hand out. Then my horror got a little bit further as I said, so what else do you do in dairy with Food Bank? And they said, did you know that nine schools in Albany, nine schools qualify for the Food Bank schools breakfast program. And those nine schools, to feed those children whose parents can't or won't give them breakfast, they have decided that obviously milk on their wheat bix is a really important part of that. So they go out and they buy the cheapest form of milk that they can, which is UHT, ultra high temperature milk. How sad is that? That, that our demographic of Albany um, is, is at that point. And of course, um, I guess what I'm saying is there's another value we need to talk about when it comes to value adding, and that is our value, our responsibility to our consumer in our very own region, because those consumers need safe, nutritious, affordable food. So my value message number one is that the 13 dairy farm, farm businesses that, that operate in the Great Southern, because of their scale, they have the capacity to produce high quality, nutritious, affordable dairy. And that is actually really important for the people when you think that 29,000 people, or sorry, 20, 29,000 meals were handed out in Albany in May, having it a product that is affordable for them is important. However, let's assume that we can do that. And I guess if there's anything anybody here could do, it would be race down to Coles and get a couple of dollar a litre milks and drop them off to food bank on a daily basis. That would be something. However, Let's think about what else the great southern dairy industry could do in its 13 dairy businesses that are down here. For a start, the industry down here has a few significant advantages, and the first is that it's actually cooler down here. I complain about the weather all the time, but for cows, the environment that we have in the great southern is absolutely perfect. Cows actually suffer from, a, from milk production um, when they have an extended period of heat, as you often get on the, on, the, on the west coast. So heat load is a significant issue over there. Down here, it is never. You don't get more than one day past 40. Um, you certainly all expire if you do. So um, we have a really good reason to be daring down here. It's also quite a bit cheaper. If you take a 150 kilometre radius from Albany into suitable dairying country and compare that price of land to the price that's 150 kilometre radius from Bunbury, it's a no-brainer. You should be down here dairy farming. Um, but they're not. We don't, we're not seeing a mass transition of change from the west coast to the south coast, despite my absolute efforts to that effect. Of course, the, the barrier, or one of the barriers in the way, is we are a bloody long way away. We put these milk tankers on a highway and send them up to Perth. So the logical question to that is, so why can't we build one down here? Why can't we scale up 
and build a processing factory down here. Now, I need to remind you at this point that not one of the Harvey, Browns or Lyon factories are currently running anywhere near capacity. So there's underutilised stainless steel um, in the existing facilities. So that's a sort of little red alert, of course, isn't it? But what if, what if we could build a factory down here? I remind you again, in valuating terms on a world scale, 35 million litres a year in this, in this area is, is minuscule. But a to-do list. What if we could create a market and be competitive in it? What if we could grab all those things that I was just talking about, our beautiful clean climate, our cooler climate, our isolation, all the, all the, all the brand things that we can actually be really authentic about, as was spoken about earlier? What if we could find an investor in stainless steel? He would say, or she would say, or they would say, we need a minimum 60 million litres if we're going to make a cheese plan. You've only got half of that down here. What can you do about that? Can you coerce um, production expansion? I'm here to tell you those 13 businesses down here would double overnight if the, if the signals were right. They said, well, let me say they could. They could scale up quickly if if they were happy to get out of their comfort zone. It's actually possible. And of course, we do have, as I said, those natural advantages of being down here. But as I heard someone, I think it might have been Jeff Foley, talk about the importance of continual, continual supply. Remember how I talked about that grass and the change of how grass is not always grass? Well, if we were to produce 60 million litres for a cheese plant, we would have to have what you call a flat supply curve, if that's a weird term that I always laugh about in the dairy industry, um, a curve that is flat. We would need the same amount of milk every month of the year to supply an economical cheese factory. And so that doesn't actually work when it's just grass because grass changes. So we would need to think about our production systems and how we might change that and be able to substantially add grain. But would that bugger up the great brand that we've got that says, hey, we're grass-based? Remember, we have to be authentic. So yes, we could double our numbers in the, in the right way, and we would absolutely have to be exceptional in terms of our efficiencies in running those businesses. Because we have competition, for example, California. That's one feedlot dairy in California that's got more cows, more dairy cows than the entire dairy cow population of the Great Southern on one farm. Every day, they feed those cows the same. Every day, those cows produce the same. And every day, they have really satisfied customers buying efficient, affordable product. So the option one, the value adding big time scale up is absolutely expensive. Should that be a barrier? Not necessarily. If someone has what I would call the fire in the belly to be actually making that happen, because of course this level of investment is the one that generates the most jobs. Um, for, the, for the region. Um, a big factory, a big feedlot farm, that's jobs galore. So we'd need investors, we'd need markets, and we'd certainly need to be able to coerce the supply, get enough dairy farms out of their current comfort zone and say, can you please get busy? How about we look at option two? How about we actually grab that gorgeous story that Sharon has just given us, and how can we work with our local boutique processes, and is there room for more? So when I think about the team of boutique processors in Derry on the south coast, I've put their five on the board, and I think about even, even the modest plans that Sharon was talking about, um, growth for them doesn't mean any more than perhaps a couple of extra employees. It doesn't mean putting a dent in anybody's vat bigger than the one that we're currently putting it in. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a small thing. However, as we've talked about, food is, is tourism. Those boutique processes are gold to the amazing South Coast brand. We just need to nurture them, help them do everything we can to get that food trail involved and excited by and supporting it, everything that we can do for these processes because we can't tell them just to grow. We can't say, would you, Chris, go out there and get yourself a decent investor and make it times 10? That's their business decision. But what we can help them do is actually bring people to their door appreciating their product. And at the same time, they're appreciating all of the beautiful attributes of the amazing South Coast. We could probably find room for more. And we may even find room for an extra two or three that really do have fire in their belly that start from nothing and want to be huge. So how would we help them? 
We would certainly want to help them have new markets. We would want to provide the expertise. We would help want to find, I guess, the, the money that might help them grow. And we would also need to assist them with product innovation. Because as Sharon explained to you, um, when you are supply, with sourcing your milk from one single source, we've got this whole damn grass thing to cope with again. And so that beautiful mammary gland, she produces very different um, components depending on the time of year. So you need a whole bunch of expertise to deal with that. So single source cheese making, and in, 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 indeed any single source dairy product, um, is challenging. And so of course how that's changed at a large scale level is that we combine all of the milk from a region and the clever people in the factory make it all even and when you pour your bottle of Harvey Fresh or Browns or uh, Pura Milk, it's exactly the same no matter what the season because there's enough dairy farm and different suppliers mixing it into that mix so they can actually make it. That is the difference. So for option two boutiques, I say once again, we need fire in the belly. We need investors, we need innovation, and we certainly need markets for them. And I know that getting just an export licence is one of the barriers that you need to think about. So can I finish now then with option three, my favourite thing, collaboration. What if, what if we could amalgamate the 35 million litres down here into one single thing? What if, what if we could build a brand and actually back it? Someone spoke about the need for authenticity, yeah. We need the people of Perth to be able to walk onto any single dairy farm down here and go, yeah, they are what they say. They look after their animals, they look after their environment, and they have a nutritious, wholesome quality product. We can do that in space. We could build a brand and be so authentic about how we deliver it. And then, because it might be difficult to justify bringing in an outside investor to bring a special processing facility here, what if just we amalgamated that, instead of having three different trucks going up the highway, we just had one brand and um, sent all of the South Coast milk into one processing unit and got that processor to agree to separate that milk from the rest, because it needs to be authentic, and brand it as such. Once again, I'm saying it needs fire in the belly because um, it's bloody hard to collaborate when you're a farmer. Um, but also, the actual business risk needs to be considered really seriously. The farms that are down here have very precious contracts and existing business relationships with their processors. We would be asking them to jump right out of their comfort zone in order to change that contract arrangement and amalgamate. Um, and of course, we would need to also find a market that says, and be do doing that research, that says, yes, the consumers would pay more uh, for a product that is exclusively South Coast. And, and looking at Jeff's work, you know, just perhaps they might. I, that, that is, that is a, a very genuine proposition because I'm so confident of our, of our authenticity. So the opportunities absolutely exist, but can I say the barriers are high and they're mostly human. The other thing, I think, is that I reckon the region actually stands to perhaps benefit more from value-adding than the individuals themselves. For every single value-adding story we've talked about and we've heard the success stories this morning, they have been very brave people. The Dellendale story, the lime burner story, they have absolutely jumped right out of that fishbowl and stuck it into the next one. You know, that is, that is, that is guts it takes to do that. And there is no guarantee of greater profit when you're big than there is when you're small. Um, and so why are we going to sit here and triple and quadruple and times 10 our production, Esther, if I'm making just the same at the end of that? But the winner, if they do that, is of course the region. So that, I think, brings me to my final point, and that is it needs to be an industry and regional partnership at every level. And I know partnership is almost a cliched word, but it is so true. We have to absolutely look after what we have. And we have exceptional, very isolated, very ethical, the magical grass-based system that is not perhaps what it seems, and and we have an industry that is so great for our amazing South Coast brand. So I guess what I want to leave you with is the challenge that somewhere, somehow, we need to inject more fire into more bellies to do something more with dairy. And I think you need to respect the fact that there's not been very many, been very many individuals or corporations that have because of the risk factor. So it needs to be something that we actually do together. So your support 
is what we need in order to have the fire that we have in that belly. Thank you, Will.